Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, a place where industry experts discuss how technology is impacting our life, our work, while also transforming entire industries and even the world. Every day, I'm going to be serving you a daily dose of optimism and motivation while highlighting along the way that technology really does work best when it brings people together. Today, Benjamin Bryle, the former Red Hat EMEA cloud manager and now founder of Cycloid, is going to be joining me on the podcast today to talk about the company he created and the vision to help organizations aid the transition to cloud by increasing their automation capabilities through a DevOps and hybrid cloud platform. But I also want to explore an environmental angle with Ben today, because companies who never previously dreamt of leaving their office lighting and heating running currently continue to leave servers running unnecessarily overnight for days at a time, wasting energy and contributing to rising energy bills, not to mention those ESG scores that we keep hearing about. So buckle up and hold on tight, because no matter where you're listening in the world to me today, It's time for me to beam your ears all the way to Paris so you can sit down with me and Benjamin where we'll explore these topics together. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? So uh, my name is Ben. I'm Cyclone founder. Uh, We are working on something which is called a DevOps and hybrid cloud platform that also embed uh, carbon impact footprints. We will have some conversation uh, together on it, I think. And uh, yeah, the goal mainly is to improve the developer experience, the efficiency of the operation, and to participate to this uh, change management world where hybrid cloud and DevOps are strategic. And when uh, when, uh, when we speak about uh, cloud uh, carbon footprint, it's also a massive impact today. So we need to make sure that uh, we use the right resources for the right people, right? Yeah, 100%. And I'm quite excited to dig a little bit deeper on this with you. But before we do, I want to take you back in time for a moment. So can you remember where your passion for tech came from or just the moment that put you on the path that you're on today? I mean, well, it wasn't a passion to yeah. be completely transparent with you. It's just like I met uh, some people uh, that uh, talked to me about back at the time hosting and managed service provider. I was looking for an internship kind of uh, stuff. And this is how it goes. And then, you know, um, I went to this uh, hosting and managed service provider world. Uh, they were dedicated uh, on a multi-cloud approach. So providing some service on AWS, GCP, and Azure. And this is how I start uh, in the tech. And I saw that... Um, I love the open source world, you know, being capable to share without having always some uh, um, financial topic. Uh, so I'm quite fun about this uh, work because back at the time I was doing some uh, law study. So I was kind of, let's say, utopist, right? <laughs> um, even if when you do, when you do uh, some uh, law study, you generally don't do uh, law at work uh, for the majority of people. But yeah. Then I started to do this, and um, this is how I start uh, to be in the tech world. And I've loved it. And yeah, we will discuss a little bit about the future. But uh, yeah, yeah, so far, everything about people, you know, when you meet the right people, you say, okay, why not? Let's work together and let's start together this, uh, this journey. 100% with you on that. And obviously, you went on to become a Red Hat EMEA cloud manager. So I'm curious. What were your biggest lessons you learned from that period in your career too? There is nothing stronger than open source. Yeah. I mean, before Red Hat, that has been acquired by uh, IBM, you know, there is a lot of people that were laughing about uh, open source, complicated to uh, commercialize, and uh, um, it's it's not a healthy uh, environment. Uh, At some point, we developed something that is proprietary and so on. And just uh, well, out of VMware so far that I've been acquired, uh, Red Hat has been the first, the biggest uh, acquisition made by uh, IBM and globally, you know, 33 billion euros. Uh, so they just show that you can do open source and you can do um, proprietary stuff and work together. And this is what definitely I've learned. 
with the complexity that it brings, you know, yeah. because um, it's not an easy topic to sell some uh, uh, enterprise uh, version uh, when you uh, put everything as an open source. But uh, I thought I think this is what I definitely learned at uh, at Red Hat that uh, everyone that uh, say or start to speak that they are stronger than open source. It's so, okay. Let's let's speak in a couple of words uh, of of yours, and 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 you will see that uh, you will find uh, something uh, in open source world that maybe will be better than what you are doing in the proprietary world. Love that. And of course, from there, you ended up becoming the founder of Cycloid. So I'm curious, there's got to be a story there. What's the story behind you becoming the founder? And, and what problems did you set out to solve from the very beginning? To try to uh, be uh, as short as possible. So as I've told you, we were working on um, system integrator, managed service provider, uh, open source, uh, multi-cloud. Yeah. We have made an all-in on OpenStack, and then uh, we have been acquired by Red Hat based on this all-in on OpenStack. Yeah. And at Red Hat, I was uh, managing what we call major product, which is uh, OpenStack on the infrastructure as a service, OpenShift on the um, platform as a service, and cloud forms on uh, uh, cloud management platform. And Everything that I saw with the love of that I have for Kubernetes, um, I saw that the problem is not about the technology. It's about how do you help this both persona, you know, the, the DevOps that, that knows everything about tools and cloud and the end user, which is 99% of the rest of the organization that don't understand anything about DevOps, cloud automation and, and the cloud carbon footprint and all this stuff. So, um, I saw the trend about Kubernetes, but I didn't see the revenue. I'm coming from the business side. And I mean, Red Hat build uh, his uh, image on uh, his 3 billion euros on IBM market. Kubernetes didn't build any revenue on anything, you know, that's starting from scratch. Will it be the future? I don't know. Will it be the next billion uh, for Red Hat? I'm sure it will not. So, um, I mean, I wanted to focus more on how do I help people, you know, focusing on the 99% of these people being capable to interact in a simple way with all these tools and cloud and let the DevOps work on their open source and attack directly tools and cloud. I was proposing this to Red Hat. Um, they love the idea. They completely share the idea. But the problem is back at the time, um, they, there is, we had really a lot of difficulties to hire talented uh, developers. We already have multiple business offer uh, and they didn't want to open a, a new subsidiary. So uh, finally I opened uh, a cycloid based on this uh, assumption that we need to help uh, this developer experience, you know, uh, we need to help efficiency around operation and helping this organization work on the change management and the DevOps and hybrid cloud approach. This is where, where I started, uh, I mean, the assumption why I started cycloid, even if, uh, Red Hat is uh, definitely a wonderful company, um, and uh, but yeah, that's life. What a great story! And of course, we're both chatting in Europe here, and we'll have people listening all over the world. And one thing that we've all got in common right now is the energy crisis. And one of the reasons I invited you on the podcast today was after reading how you believe that many companies are now going to be changing their attitudes towards things like leaving their office lighting and heating running or or wasting energy and contributing to the rising energy bills and the, the rising costs there. But can you expand on that? Yeah, definitely, Bob. Let's let's not too deep in the technical detail about how it's work and but just and or giving you too many data. But let's keep let's try to keep it uh, as simple as possible. First, if internet would be a country, uh, it would be the first country that polluates. This is factual. Uh, second, if we speak about uh, data centers, um, there is today an average of ten percent which is uh, done by the data centers. So on the green topic, there is various topic. Okay, there, there is some company that focus on the global pictures about how do I decrease my uh, carbon impact, you know? So there is various piece uh, on this. On our side, we try to focus on the infrastructure layer, which is already a, a big topic. Um, so that is why we have built what we call a 
cloud carbon footprint that allow uh, any user to be capable to first know what is his impact when he deploy in a project, what is the impact in terms of carbon footprints uh, when uh, the products have been deployed, and to be capable also to have something that is understable because uh, the kilowatt hour, you know, doesn't speak to anyone. Uh, but if you tell, okay, this is a, a flight between uh, Paris to New York, it speaks to to someone, you know, mm-hmm. or this is, uh, you have spent, you know, uh, uh, a forest of uh, 10,000 uh, trees, you know, or uh, this is also something that we love because it seems that it's ring a bell to everyone is uh, the number of, um, of uh, a football uh, park, like a uh, uh, stadium, you know, the, the size of stadium uh, does, speaks to everyone. I don't know why, but yeah, the, you know, when you say there is a, it's, it's, it's equivalent to 10 uh, stadium, it speaks, yeah. you know? And what I strongly believe in the IT world and in our field around infrastructures is it's not that people don't care, you know? Everyone with the level of uh, uh, information that we have today is completely aware about what happened. But when it comes to how do I, Make sure that what I do is uh, the less uh, resource uh, behavior, you know, um, they generally don't know. And especially when it comes about DevOps and, 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 and developers that are using cloud and tools, they are completely not aware about what is the impact. So our goal with this cloud carbon footprint, where we are based on the open source software that I work on this topic, quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, the goal is to help them understanding their uh, impact and make some better recommendation uh, and uh, and better uh, go, I mean, to be capable that they make some actions to decrease the level of, uh, of, uh, of cloud usage. Because, I mean, this is a challenge for everyone. And if choosing, we are living in a hybrid cloud, if choosing one cloud about the other because it's less impactful in terms of resource, even if it's cost a little bit because our cloud cloud footprint is of course linked to our cloud cost management because uh, the first criteria for an organization is uh, price then performance. But we still we start to see a lot of company that are interesting about this cloud carbon footprint. They need to make this choice. Yeah. And then, uh, to have the information and to be capable to to make this choice, and when um, and if they didn't make this choice, I mean, we took the opinion on our side to be a little bit more stronger. When there is the message that okay, there is this recommendation. If you do that, then under that, that, you will decrease your carbon footprint. So just do it, because now you can't say that you can't. You don't have the information. You don't know how to do it. You have everything inside our platform that helping you is not in not so much. Um, effort to decrease the carbon footprint. So I think it's something which is um, which is great to have because uh, I strongly believe that uh, in our world people are not really you know uh, aware. But uh, you know when I deploy an application or when I manage an application, what is the carbon footprint of this uh, application? You know, and on our side we speak only on the infrastructure layer. And we see that there is tons of uh, improvement that can be made, you know, mm. but it's a global topic. You know, it's application and infrastructures and it's glob- on overall uh, uh, carbon footprint about the company. But uh, yeah, as we are working on infrastructures, we focus on this, right? Yeah, 100 percent. And of course, another global topic is the rapid transition of organizations to the cloud and multi-cloud, et cetera. So, so with that in mind, can you tell me more about how businesses often currently lack visibility and control over their own servers? I mean, well, we know that now we are living in a multi-cloud area, you know, with multiple mm. tools. According to Gartner, there is 28 tools around the topic of infrastructure. So how do you want to become an expert on these 28 tools? Yeah. And when you are a developer, you know, it's like everybody knows now that or you want to become a DevOps and you spend your time to become a DevOps, you know, and then after a couple of years, coming from system infrastructures world, you will become a DevOps, you know, developing some automation on cloud. Or you will never become a DevOps, you know, because it's too complicated. You know, you can't. You just need to open the um, the dashboard of cloud provider, and you will see that it's not an easy one. So 
they definitely we are definitely in a uh, in the world of multi cloud approach the problem is that um back at the time they were managing uh, in a different way uh, vmware aws gcp azure and so on but with the rise of uh, open source, such as infrastructure as code with uh, Terraform, such as uh, Ansible, such as various open source world, you can start to have the capability for now to have a, um, a multi-cloud approach where you don't have to bring a lot of competency on various tools, but focusing on a couple of tools that helping you deploying on the cloud provider. And on our side at Cycloid, we try to help uh, this capability for DevOps to accelerate this open source world and to be capable to design this self-service portal for uh, end user being capable to address tools on cloud without having to develop so many expertise or becoming a DevOps that will never happen. So we see that um, anyone, even now startup or scale up, we start to see scale up that are in the multi-cloud world, we are in this world. I mean, uh, when you have a, when you make some acquisition, you acquire some company that are maybe on another cloud provider than the one you are using. And this uh, famous one cloud strategy will never happen, you know, because um, we can't really compare AWS, GCP, and Azure, you know. There is various services, they, they have their strengths and they have uh, their weakness. And um, they, there is still a lot of investment in terms of VMware, and we see that uh, the financial results of VMware are really great. So the end of uh, private cloud will never happen for now. I mean, of course, there is a trend, but we should never forget that uh, in US, uh, it's 10% of uh, the cloud provider, 10% uh, of the application are using a cloud provider. So there is still 90% on private cloud. But when it's come and when we loop, to the cloud um, cost management, uh, according to the AWS, making a move to traditional infrastructures to a cloud provider is decreasing by five, the usage of uh, carbon footprint. Um, I would add, in addition, that if you if you if you use the self if you use the uh, the service managed by the cloud provider. Otherwise, if you do a traditional lift and shift, at the end, I my personal conviction is that you will use more resources than what you need, you know. Mm. But um, but yeah, I mean, um, multi cloud is a is a journey of everyone, and they are all, all lost, you know, completely lost, uh, because um, they start by on prem, and then you know, for politi political reason and plenty of good reason also, they start to have one cloud, but as it is the war between different cloud, they start to have multi-cloud. And, you know, with the Kubernetes world, it starts to even bring more complexity, you know. Just run a, a Drupal software on the Kubernetes, you will see how long you, need, you will need to spend to develop your own on-prem Kubernetes cluster or using the one from cloud provider. It's take quite a long if you want to have something, you know, from end-to-end -end working. So based on this assumption, you know, uh, they try to find some solution, but uh, hiring tons of DevOps is really complicated because there is no no enough resources. You know, mm. um, they try to build their own uh, portal internally because they see that they can't uh, answer the need of end user that are completely lost. You know, just uh, just uh, where is my application located? You know, <laughs> just this information. <laughs> Sometimes you know they are just lost on this information, and. Um, and yeah, and, well, we start uh, we start to see a lot of traction on our side. Where even when they develop their own portal, they see okay, development is one side, but maintaining is another side of uh, the coin. And uh, they see okay, let's focus on our core business, and uh, let's try also to uh, a decrease of uh, our level of uh, usage, our level of carbon footprint, our level of uh, you know quota and budget management to make sure that. Uh, uh, we see less and less, and this is what we see also, uh, less and less go back to traditional infrastructures because uh, they fail, you know, uh, the move to cloud and or the Kubernetes approach because it's a complete new world, right? Mm, really is. And I'm curious, with there have been a, an increased focus on things like sustainability and ESG scores are being used for businesses to uh, to judge how efficient they are. Are you seeing an increase in organizations wanting to regain control of their cloud operations and, and actively limit the energy that's needlessly being wasted? And how are you helping them? Is that something that you're seeing more of? 
so what I see to be transparent with you is that any, everyone is uh, looking for this kind of how can I impact my carbon footprint started with infrastructures, but more globally. We yeah. see it, you know. We see that they want to be aware about the level of uh, usage, you know, uh, about uh, a, a classification between infrastructures, application, how can I improve the recommendation? They loved it also. Um, I didn't see so far some company that uh, want to work through quota because we have a feature which is quota management, but based on carbon footprint, because um, so far they are a little bit scary to don't be able to answer the capability to deploy the application or to use this application because there are two resource demanding, you know, mm. back at the time, you know, we were, uh, as the, the, the resources wasn't really uh, unlimited through the cloud provider, we were carefully about how we develop the application, you know, using less resources, try to make it work in the couple of servers that we had or, you know, tons of servers, but we didn't have the unlimited of uh, the cloud provider. And now that we have the unlimited of cloud provider, we see that application or, you know, the developers are a little bit late, uh, less caring about you know the resources that they are requ re requesting from the infrastructure layer. So to answer your question, we see that they need the information, they want the recommendation, but when it comes to at the beginning working on quota management to make sure that if your project doesn't respect this and that, you won't be able to, do, to deploy it, we see that um, it's not a lot of time the case. We don't have any customers that use this quota management for, uh, they want the information, but they, they want to be capable to compare between on-prem cloud, uh, but they, 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 and they will try to use the less, uh, uh, the less, uh, the, how can I say, the, the application that will use the less uh, cloud provider uh, resources, but you know, limiting through resources, for now we don't see it. But we see that everyone is, uh, I mean, for major company, they start to have, as you know, sustainability officer, CTO that moving from CTO to sustainability officer, because this is the next big challenge. And it's yeah. not a, an easy one, you know, because as you know, but I, I think it's going in too much detail, but level one, level three, level, th level two and level three parties, you know, it's really complex to be capable to, um, know what is your real impact. And we see that, uh, for example, AWS so far didn't uh, uh, establish a number about uh, his uh, level three impact of uh, cloud carbon footprint because he's just not aware and they're working on it. And I'm, and I'm sure that are completely aware about uh, the challenge and the business impact that it is because it's everything linked to business. But so far, if you want to do something uh, um, that makes sense, um, there is a lot of assumption, including the cloud carbon footprint that we have took, which is based on the open source uh, world. Uh, it's an assumption, you know, about mm -hmm. how you, do you calculate this carbon footprint. It's not uh, coming from API of cloud provider. It's top uh, bottom up coming from data centers with public uh, information about uh, which kind of which uh, data center, what is the level of impact that he bring, and all this stuff. But it's a uh, I don't know how to say this in English, empiric. I mean, uh, can we say this? Like, um, well, I don't know the word, but yeah, it's it's work in progress, right? Yes, work in progress. And as you said, it, it is the next big challenge. So I'm curious, what makes you hopeful about the future and where we're heading? And equally, what excites you about the role that you and Cyclord will, will play in this future too? I mean, to have a little bit some humility on yeah. our side, you know, we are, we are taking only one piece of this uh, global topic. We are focusing on infrastructures. The carbon footprint impact of a company is much more wider than than than, than this. So um, on our side, we are really, uh, I would say, exciting to allow anyone being capable to have the visibility on the infra infrastructure layer to see what is the impact and how can I make this recommendation and what could I do factually. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't do it, Secret will remind you that uh, uh, you will have to do it. So uh, it brings also a little bit more impact uh, inside the company, you know, not working only on the tech, you know, because let's be transparent. You don't wake up, you know, uh, uh, when you're born and say, okay, I want to work in DevOps and multi-cloud approach, you know, you don't. 
<laughs> but if you start to see that what you are developing is also bringing more uh, attention when it starts to car uh, cloud carbon footprint, I think it's quite uh, an interesting topic. And it's not an ending topic. You know, it's just the beginning of uh, this uh, this topic. And we start also to build some partnership with some uh, application layer that are working on how can I improve my application and uh, resource demanding in terms of uh, carbon footprint impact. So um, yeah, it's quite challenging, quite interesting, and. Um, and based on the biggest customers that we have, I mean, uh, it's not an easy one. You know, when you have uh, uh, 20, 30 data centers, when you spend uh, 100 million euros uh, in cloud provider, wow. I mean, uh, it's a huge topic. And uh, this, I didn't see for now uh, the perfect solution that would, do, that, that would do everything, right? Yeah. And we started the podcast today talking about your origin story. And we've now come full circle as we're looking to the future. But once again, I'm going to ask you to look back throughout your career. And what would you say the biggest lessons that you've learned from your career in tech are? And, and uh, maybe we can uh, inspire somebody listening somewhere in the world. I mean, on my side, there is nothing done without people. I mean, we can, uh, you know have uh, the best technology, the best way to do. And I think the best lesson that I've learned is you, do, you don't do everything without people. Mm -hmm. And everything that is the value of a company is the people that you have behind. I don't believe about IPs and all this. This is bullshit, you know. Yeah. The IPs, which is today, in six months, is deprecated. It's, if you don't have the right people that, you know, maintain it and develop uh, uh, some, uh, some nice feature or is with you inside the company, you don't do anything. So, I mean, my true conviction is that uh, we should spend as much as, as much time as possible with the people to make sure that we find the right uh, balance between their need and the, and the company needs to make sure that we are the most efficient. So uh, I would say let's focus, focus more on people and how do you attract talent, keep your talent, and make sure that we are living in a world that are, is more uh, carbon footprint respectable. You know, uh, I started the company six years ago uh, um, as fully remote, and there is tons of VC that explain me that remote doesn't work. Well, now they don't have to explain to me that remote doesn't work. But I see that, you know, um, it's all about people, you know? It's, it's it's everything about how do do we have the right people and how do we make sure that uh, we keep our talent. It's a challenge for us, for everyone, uh, because it's the war. Um, I mean, uh, outside when it comes to talent, but um, I would say this: you know, take care about people. I completely agree with you. And I'd love to push you on this and expand on that a little bit because none of us are able to achieve any success in our lives or in our careers without a little help along the way. So is there a particular person that you're grateful towards who helped you get where you are that you want to give a little shout out and we can uh, send them a, a thank you out there? But who would you choose? I mean, my team. I mean... Yeah. Uh... You know, we are really a small team. On our side, we are close to 50 people. We have started with nothing. You know, I have started with nothing. A couple of uh, customers that trust us, uh, helping us uh, developing our platform. And um, I'm not coming from uh, the tech world as a tech uh, tech guys. I'm coming from the business world. We have some people that uh, are still here that join us since the beginning, and we are growing with them. And I won't be here in front of you if uh, if 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 they were wasn't here. So the one that I want to strongly uh, you know, um, thanks is is my team, you know, because I'm only the speaker, but I'm not the one that you know uh, do the job factually. You know, um, I don't know how to code, and it's not my expertise. I try to build something a company where um, they are capable to. Um, to feel better, you know, to have a little bit less stress and all this stuff. Uh, but um, without them, I think, you know, I, I, will, I won't be here. What a beautiful answer. I absolutely love you for, for that answer there. And for, before I let you go, for anyone listening that just wants to dig a little bit deeper on the kind of things that we've talked about today, how cycloid help, et cetera, or maybe even contact your team, what's the best starting point for everything? So we have an uh, open source uh, world that you can find us on GitHub around cycloid.io. We have our website also, uh, cycloid.io. So it's the two worlds that uh, you know people are chasing us. So 
we have we release a lot of lot of open source world that can be used by anyone uh, which is completely open source uh, it's even used by competitors so you know it's i like the as i've said open source world and we also pro provide a, a product approach but uh, but yes i strongly believe that uh, uh, anyone can uh, can use the open source world and and, and the proprietary without any uh, any issues well, one of the big reasons I invited you on the podcast today was talk about Cycloid and how you're launching GreenOps this September that's going to help organizations improve sustainability of their cloud infrastructure and automating the process of turning servers on and off when not in use and all that exciting stuff. And it's so important, but I think more than anything, it's your personal story that's brought this topic to life today and the importance of people and you being an incredibly humble leader throughout as well. So a big thank you for taking the time to share your story today. Thank you to have uh, invited me. Sorry for my English, but I try to be as uh, as self-explanatory, <laughs> as simple as I can in English. With a rapid transition of organizations to cloud and multi-cloud, businesses currently lack visibility and control over their servers in many cases. So for me, it was very interesting to hear more about how Cycloid is helping organizations regain some of that control of their cloud operations while also limiting the energy being needlessly wasted by organizations too. But how are you dealing with all these issues that we've raised today, especially with the increasing focus on sustainability and ESG scores? And I'd love to hear your thoughts. You've heard from me, you've heard from Benjamin today, but I want to hear about your stories. What keeps you awake at night? How you're keeping your open-mindedness alive and what lessons you've learned along the way? If you or your business need help with business blogs and thought leadership content for your leadership team, or you want help launching your own podcast and letting somebody else worry about editing audio files and uploading to Apple Podcasts, etc., you can find out more about how you can work with me by visiting my website, techblogwriter.co.uk. I always like to finish every episode by saying technology works best when it brings people together. And the fact that you tune in every single day further proves that point. So I hope you'll join me again tomorrow. But a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Oh, 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 oh,